Hey, I'd like to welcome you to another episode of the Mission Matters Business Podcast, your source for all things business. My name is Adam Torres. You can follow me on Instagram at Ask Adam Torres. Keep up with my book releases, book tour schedule, signings, all that other good stuff. Always love to connect with you there. And as always, if you'd like to apply to become a co-author of one of my upcoming books, just head on over to the website, missionmatters.com, and click on Become an Author to Apply. All right, today I have Stephen Beeson on the line. He's founder and CEO of the Opa Rasa Group, and he's also author of the upcoming book, Valued, How Purpose-Driven Businesses Can Conquer Addiction and Marginalization in America. Stephen, welcome to the show. Thank you very much for having me on, Adam. All right, so excited about today. Um, we got a lot to cover. We're going to talk about the Opa Rasa Group. We're going to talk a little bit more about the upcoming book that you're writing. Um, but before we get into that, um, let's just start off with talking a little bit more about your background. So how did you get started in your career? Well, Adam, uh, first of all, I, I grew up on a farm in North Alabama, which is kind of the middle of nowhere. And, uh, you know, I, I discovered uh, years ago that uh, a, a good way to not work hard on the farm was to get a formal education. So uh, I got to go to college so, <laughs> a little that's bit prophetic. early. That's, and, uh, that's prophetic, Stephen, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, and then then we go back to farming. I know it's great. But, uh, you know, we over the years, uh, one thing that has held true is that I have valued learning and self-growth. And um, I personally am a person in long-term recovery, and what that means for me is I've been approximately five years without a drink or a drug, um, and, uh, and and I don't know, a lot of people are probably aware of the opioid epidemic in addition to the pandemic we currently have going on in the United States. And What I mean by that is about 70,000 young people will die this year of opioid overdoses nationwide. Uh, that means we'll lose more young people this year uh, by September than we lost in the entire Vietnam conflict. Wow. And I'm kind of flash forward. I know it's a tremendous number of, of people. Uh, and being being uh, hyper involved kind of in the recovery community um, had the opportunity to realize two things. One, that uh, capitalism and some of my background, uh, MBAs, master's degrees, and so on and so forth, was helpful in um, addressing some of the challenges these young people experienced. And so that's that's what led to my current career. Now, before this, I was the Chief Financial and Operating Officer uh, for a couple of different software uh, companies uh, was promoted into the CEO position by the last group, which was a VC-backed uh, VC backed group out of Denver, and uh, left that to go form the social enterprise. So that was probably wow, a little a bit too fast, but I'll I'll stop. No, that no, that was no. It's a, it's a great story, and I think it's a great transition, also. Um, so let's uh, let's get into the Opa Rasta group. Uh, tell us a little bit more about about why you started this and and what you're doing. Well, part of it is actually it's the name of your entire organization, right? And so your entire website is Mission Matters, and we believe that more than anything. And what I mean by that is we are a purpose-driven social enterprise. So what a social enterprise is in our mind is it's a for-profit company that leverages the power of capitalism, the most transformative social change agent ever created by mankind, in order to bridge a social gap that exists. The fundamental purpose of capitalism is to change people's lives for the better. And what we do is we're focused on OPA, the Greek word, OPA, celebrate life. You hear it when, you also hear it when people break a plate in a Greek restaurant. People, somebody will scream out, OPA! And mm -hmm. what it, OPA has a dual meaning. It also means watch out for the things that trip you up. And so we feel like a celebration of life while watching out for the things that trip you up is the essence of good recovery. And, of course, that leads us to Rasa. Rasa is Sanskrit for – I'll pause right there and say sometimes people say that's a pretty complex name, but it's a great story. And I say yes, and there are other layers to it because there are often deep, deep layers to people who struggle with addiction. Um, for myself, I grew up in a world where I have what is called severe complex PTSD that sort of over a long period of time led me to do some things that were really challenging to me on a social level. Now, I also happen to have a fairly deep background in business. And when I got into recovery, what I discovered was that even with that deep background in business, 
meaning, uh, you know, an MBA with a master's degree, you know, a specialization in entrepreneurship and finance, master's degree in accountancy, ABD, and a PhD in business from one of the world's leading universities. And, uh, and I have sort of that background. Um, it was still difficult to get back on my feet. How much more challenging is it for a young person who is 24 years old, hasn't done much with their lives in terms of advancing their career prospects, and has gotten lost down a dark path. Can we offer these people a light in the darkness, and can we pull them forward using capitalism as our powerful change agent? And the most amazing thing happened over the last almost four years now. We've done this with 11 people. Every single one of them has achieved two years in recovery, and they've achieved, on average, a 350% wage increase over the, over the two years that they spent with us. So we've had amazing success, and now we're seeking to, we're, we're working really hard to scale that, and we've done a pretty good job of it today. So I'll pause there, and anything in there that you want to throw, at, throw back at me? Wow, that's amazing. Um, and I see that, I love, I love the way you kind of developed this model. So you now know that what you're doing is work, and, and this is, I, I would argue, this is partially from, or maybe the majority, from your melding your business background with some of the personal things that you've gone through and shared with us today. So you've now created, you, you kind of have your product market fit on what you're doing, how you're helping. You've seen the wage increases. You've seen um, how you've been able to help um, some of these individuals. I mean, what, what's next for you in terms of in terms of scaling the value that you're providing here? Because that's what you're really doing. I, I even hate to use the word scale, but I guess that's what we do. That's what everybody understands. But really, into being more of value and helping more people. That's all you're talking about doing. What, what's What's next? Well, you, you, you nailed it uh, because the, the challenge as business people that we often have is that we run into things that are wonderful point solutions. Mm -hmm. But what I mean by that is I am the, what gets me to one stage of the business world. So if I'm growing a business from one to from zero to one million dollars, from one to five to five to 50, I become the solution. And then that solution becomes the problem. And so the question, and by the way, the problem doesn't mean like it has to be gotten rid of. It just means it becomes yeah. the challenge that I have to overcome, right? Mm -hmm. And um, and so, sorry, I put my I put my professorial hat on there. That the question that we have right now is, am I the solution in this problem, right? And in this in this world, I've been doing a lot of really deep uh, work with these individuals that have come through our program. The next question is, can we scale it? Can we unplug me from it? create systems and processes that replace me and allow those systems and processes to help five to 10 people simultaneously. And then the next step is if we can do it with five to 10 simultaneously and create great outcomes, can we do it with 50, you know, and then the question becomes, can we go nationwide? But so those are kind of our next three stages as I look at it. We've already demonstrated that we can create profitable outcomes meaning that we can return value to people who put money into the system. The next question is, can we do that at scale? No, that, it's really exciting to me. And I think what, what's also really interesting to me is you don't typically hear when somebody's talking about uh, social enterprise and, and growing a social enterprise business to really um, do it from your standpoint in terms of the business logic. Because what you just described is this happens to be on the business podcast, but if we were on my tech podcast, every SaaS company is going through this. Every type of company is going through exactly what you're saying when they start from those grassroots uh, beginnings. So I love it. Um, and I love the thought process behind it and you know every point's going to have its challenge but um, that, that that's the process um, I want to spend a little bit of time on your book that you're writing um, so tell okay. us a little bit more about um, about the, the inspiration behind this and, uh, and and number one and number two when we can expect this thing to come out I know you're this is why I like it when somebody tells you they're writing a the book I'm the king of hey get it done I want to read it so tell us a little bit more where you're at absolutely we're uh, you know 50 plus pages in at this point and uh, one of the questions that I commonly get is, well, Stephen, you're trying to solve a social problem and you're trying to build a profitable company at the same time, and that can't be done. And my response mm -hmm. to that includes a word that I won't repeat on your podcast that starts with <laughs> full, right? I'm like, exactly. you know, by, by the way, I totally agree it's more complex. That doesn't, just because it's complex and hard does not mean that it shouldn't be done. And or I, rockets, and I, so, or rockets, and Elon Musk is doing I, that. Right? I mean, what are you okay? You can't do that, but you can do rockets. Rockets are pretty complex, I'm told. 
Rockets are complex. We have put a man on the moon. It's been a minute, right? Um, <laughs> the, 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 the fun part, we now, the United States now has a space agency, okay? If we can have a space agency, surely we can use purpose-driven business to help solve addiction and marginalization, okay? And, and so what I do in this book is we very cleanly start to describe situations in which marginalization has happened, right? So whether it's, whether it's addiction or people being, uh, you know, de-incarcerated, right? So trying to reintegrate veterans coming back from war zones, trying to reintegrate into society, uh, people who have, people who have struggled from in various areas as groups. Have, have there been situations where businesses have been created? And so, one of the examples we use is Dave's Killer Bread, which many of your listeners may have picked up in a store, right? Sold the Flowers Food for $275 million in 2015. Hmm. How many times do you have a quarter of a billion dollar exit of a bread company? This is a, this thing was a social <laughs> enterprise, right? <laughs> um, Hypertherm is another great example, a 50-year-old company based in New Hampshire that uh, is, is designed around social enterprise. Ben and Jerry's, Patagonia. Um, the list goes on, and in fact, some of the greatest brand names in this world are built around social enterprise concepts. They help specific groups of people. Warby Parker is one of the most famous recent examples. And so in the book, what we're trying to do is we're saying, listen, if these organizations can do this, then what's special about them? And the answer is not that, the pe that people buy the goods because the goods or services are provided by people who are involved in a social enterprise. What is different about these organizations is that they are able to attract better employees, more loyal, long-term, harder working employees on average than companies that do not have a social enterprise bent. And so the next, the next chapters are going to start tying in work, work out of, uh, uh, Wharton and some of the other top schools that say, hey, listen, if I have an organization built around a principles-based, purpose-driven model, then the people inside it are more likely to be givers. And because those people are more likely to be givers, then if we go to somebody like Adam Grant's work, we can see better outcomes. And I'll tie up with this. A lot of my model is not based, it's, I didn't just make this up, right? I went out and found really, really smart people, like, like I'm not. I found really smart people who had been doing this really well and I went and bugged them until they talked to me. Because I'm not all that smart, I'm just persistent. And um, one of the guys I reached out to was a guy named Greg Block, who here in Atlanta, Georgia, and I want to give a shout out to Greg, he's an amazing guy. And what he's done here in Atlanta is built First Step Staffing. Ten years ago, First Step Staffing was employing 120 formerly homeless people. This year, they will employ close to 12,000 formerly homeless people in Atlanta, Philadelphia, wow. Nashville, and Los Angeles. And Greg created that organization. And 60% of those people will stay out of homelessness every year. Wow. Now, that, that's how you solve a big social problem right there. Um, that's absolutely Greg, amazing. <laughs> yeah. And Greg and I have another call tomorrow. And I just, I, you know, I'm always going to give Greg a shout out because, you know, I, I, I saw his article in Forbes, and I said, I, that guy gets it. We can use that model to, to help solve addiction, too. Man, that's exciting. Um, so, Steve and I can talk to you about this all day long, but we're about out of time. Um, that being said, if somebody's listening to this and they want to learn more about Opa Rasa Group or uh, also about your book, your upcoming book, I mean, what's the best way for people to connect with your content and with your team? If you want to look at our for-profit side, which is where we look at how we purchase companies and build those into our social model, that's www.opaRASA.com. And if you want to look at our program, and we'd love to see you do that and give us some feedback, it's OPARASA.org. Uh, that's our foundation arm, and so we have those bridged together. 
Fantastic. Well, Stephen, really appreciate you coming on the show today and uh, sharing more about your background and your journey and also all the great work that you're doing to help others over at the Opal Rasa Group. And to the audience, as always, thank you for tuning in. Hope you got a lot of value out of this. If you did, don't forget to subscribe to the podcast, uh, leave me a review on the, on the Apple iTunes Store. And if you're watching this on our YouTube channel, Mission Matters Business, definitely give us a subscribe there, but also leave us some comments on the video. Love to know what kind of projects and things that you're working on. And Stephen, thanks again for coming on the show. Thanks for having me, Adam.